Leptictidium is most famous for its appearance in Walking with Beasts, where the small mammal is hopping around the forest and survives, fortunately, a volcanic eruption that releases a bunch of gases from a lake near what will become Messel, Germany. Those same gases at the bottom of the lake prevented a lot of decomposition, which means we have really, really good fossils from there. There's fossils of turtles caught in the act. There's fossils of things related to horses with the entire embryo young still inside of it. There's also a lot of plants and insects and things that have been found in this formation. And the thing is, Leptictidium, unlike what was shown in Walking with Beasts, didn't always get out of the lake. Meaning we also have some Leptictidium fossils from there that are really, really well preserved. Leptictidium was very, very successful as a genus. Even with just the fossils, not even being able to do any kind of genetics on this because they lived around 50 million years ago, we still understand very well that there were at least eight valid species, which is a lot. Now real quick, just with the difference with genera and with species, you have the genus Panthera, which is, you know, the big cats. And then you have Panthera Anca, the jaguar, or Panthera Leo, the lion. It's pretty straightforward with some of these names, but that does mean they're all still very distinctly different species, despite generally being related and in some ways very similar. So with Leptokidium and just having the bones, we can still tell pretty much that same thing. First fossils of Leptokidium weren't actually described until 1962, and they weren't from the Messel pit. However, based on the teeth and the little parts of the jaw we have of those first ones, we can say that some of the ones coming from the Messel pit are the same species, Leptokidium otterense. But like I said, that's just some of them. There's actually three entire species that all come from the Messel pit mean that they would have been living alongside one another and not necessarily directly conflicting or competing with one another. So again, they were successful as a genus. In fact, there's some fossils of related animals like Leptictus, which come from North America. So they have this really broad swath of habits they were able to be successful in across the northern continents. However, again, this is also during the Eocene, which was pretty ubiquitous for having pretty similar environments across the northern hemisphere. So we need to look into it in a little bit more detail to understand what they were and why they were so successful. Within Leptictidium itself, there's still some things we don't know. For example, one of the most distinctive characteristics it's almost always presented with, which is this long, movable nose. Now, the thing is, it's still pretty likely that it did have this, especially when you look at modern day animals with certain features that are really similar on the skull. And that modern day animal is gonna be the elephant shrew or the sengi. On the skull of Sengi, there's these little fossa just in front of the eyes, and a fossa is just kind of a depression in the skull, and that connects muscles that control its nose and let its nose be able to move around a lot more independently. On Leptictidium, it had the same kind of depressions on the skull just in front and below the eyes, meaning it probably had a pretty similar kind of proboscis-like nose, which it could use to sniff around through leaf litter and dirt. But Leptictidium wasn't quite as simple as just a big sengi or a big elephant shrew. And part of that is because, while well, yes, it was bigger, it also was probably bipedal, based on the fact that the back legs are a lot longer than the forelimbs. And I'll get more into that later, because locomotion is its whole thing in how Leptictidium works. But first we're going to move to the idea that, no, it was just a bigger one. Because elephant shrews today are really, really small. Meanwhile, Leptictidium, while still a relatively small mammal, could get almost three feet long in the largest species, Leptictidium tobiani. This is one of the three species from the Messel pit, and that means we have an entire fossil of it, meaning we can measure it really, really accurate for its total size. Now I said almost three feet, it would have been around 87 centimeters, so still just a little bit less than that three feet. Meanwhile, the other species from the Messel pit are one of them, Leptictidium otterense, which would have been around two feet or 60 centimeters. And then there's Leptictidium netsuum, which would have been around 78 centimeters or two and a half feet. So there's a range of sizes they were, and none of them were particularly massive animals, but it is really interesting to see that they are filling these kind of different niches of mid-sized, potentially hunters and omnivores. The modern day Sengi uses its nose to push through leaf litter and soil in order to find grubs and then grabs them with its tongue really quickly and eats them. Now, we don't know for sure if Leptictidium actually used its tongue to grab prey. It's a lot easier to grab prey like that when you're already this close to the ground like a Sengi would be. But Leptictidium probably did something similar, 
there's at least some reports that there are stomach contents in some of the fossils from the mesal pit that include things like potentially parts of hard insects. So you have like beetle shells and things in there, like the, the back elytra, the wing covers. But then there's also at least one that reportedly has a lizard. Unfortunately, a lot of the work on leptictidium has been done in French and German, which I don't speak and I wasn't able to get access to those papers. But when you're looking at some of the fossils of Lepictidium from the mesal pit, you do see kind of black masses near where the stomach and gut should be. And I'm sure if you got up closer, you'd probably be able to find little pieces of bone that you could recognize as, oh, that's a lizard, or little pieces of exoskeleton that you go, oh, that's a beetle. This makes sense as part of the diet because insects and small reptiles would have been very plentiful around the mesal pit, but also France and England where other species have been found. And the first species of this coming from England, Leptictidium prouti, would have lived in an entirely different world during the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. The PETM was a period of intense warming during the planet's climatic history. In fact, it was so warm that when we're talking about the mesal pit, you need to think about an environment that was subtropical. So very different from Germany today. In fact, it would have been very dry around the equator at this time as well, which there were some animals that managed, but we're talking about Leptictidium, not the equatorial animals. But this subtropical environment in Europe meant there would have been rich forests, but also a large diversity of life. Even in the mesal pit, we get tons of different kinds of reptiles and amphibians all found there, as well as many kinds of insects. Like I mentioned, the decay processes slowed down because of the volcanic gases, meaning we have great, great fossils from the mesal pit. And the fossils from the mesal pit show that other mammals were doing really well at this time too. There's mammals that are related to early horses. There's early primates. There's even an early pangolin. The mesal pit's been a really rich source of different animals that would eventually evolve into things that are at least known today. Maybe not super common on the consideration of pangolins, but they're still around. So it's really useful for understanding how this kind of early surge of mammal evolution took place after the extinction that killed off the non-avian dinosaurs. The mesal pit is also useful because we're able to find fossils of plants too. There's things like water lilies and dogwood trees and conifer trees. It honestly paints a picture of an environment that wouldn't seem too alien today. There's things that make sense in a large forest with many of the similar, at least, kinds of trees that we would expect to see in a healthy forest today. It's honestly kind of astounding that it's so similar to some modern day subtropical forests. For me personally, my favorite plant from the mesal pit are the ones that are related to tea plants today because I drink a lot of tea. And who knows, maybe Lectoptidium didn't drink tea, but it probably at least ate some of those plants because there's at least one fossil that does show some plant material in the stomach as well. And again, a lot of this work is done in German and French, so I can't necessarily narrow down exactly what it is, but at least that report is there. And there are some suggestions that maybe that material just washed into the stomach and maybe it was more carnivorous, but based on how kind of flat and calm most lakes are, I find that unlikely unless we do more specific research on that specific layer of the lake deposits coming from the mesal pit. And so there's their diet at least. There were these little mammals just moving around the forests in Europe around 50 million years ago. But that doesn't necessarily narrow down how they moved, and this is one of the bigger points of contention with Leptictidium. Because basically there's been two different ideas. One is that it was running almost like a dinosaur, like a theropod, you know, long tail hanging out behind it, running on two legs. Meanwhile, the other idea has been that they were saltatorial, or they would hop around. Now, the first study to try and narrow this down looked at the hips and found there's really only one joint between the back vertebra and the hips. And if it was hopping around, even with a relatively small animal, that's gonna put a lot of weight and stress on that singular joint. So that may have been one reason that they may not have been hopping around. This is the author who suggested it was running around. Additionally, they also found that the tibia and the fibula were entirely separate bones. In most hopping animals, you actually see these fused together or at least become very tightly associated in order to help deal with the stress of landing. This is especially true in even very common hopping animals, including frogs. And actually, because frogs also land on their forelimbs, they actually have fused their forelimbs together too. So instead of having a separate tibia and fibula, those are fused in the back legs. And then instead of having a separate ulna and radius in the arms, those are fused together in the front arms of frogs. Based on the fossils from the mesal pit though, they're not fused in leptictidium. 
which, you know, that's good evidence that, hey, look, they probably weren't hopping. We don't see these adaptations. Later researchers, though, looked at those bones more closely and said, okay, they weren't fused, but they were probably at least very close together and could have really easily been held together very tightly, the same way that actually our ankles are held together. There's no direct contact between some of our ankle bones, but there are these strong ligaments and tendons running between them in order to help hold them all in the right places. And maybe that's what was happening with leptictidium. Essentially, those two bones would be right next to one another, and then they'd have a series of ligaments running right in between one another to hold those bones closely together and give them more stability. I already mentioned leptictus, which is related to leptictidium, and it actually does have those two bones being fused. So it is really good evidence that even if leptictidium didn't necessarily have that same fusion and was hopping around, that it did eventually evolve in that lineage at some point. Unfortunately though, I didn't find anything specifically about that hip joint though. So a lot of the jury is kind of still out on how leptictidium got around. Based on the fact that later in the lineage though, there was more of that fusion of the tibia and fibula, I'd guess they probably hopped around at least somewhat. And now moving into the question in the title, what was it? We don't really know. Unfortunately, with a lot of these very early mammals from just after the extinction, we don't have many of their ancestors because mammals weren't as common before the extinction. And then afterwards, there's a lot of diversity really, really quickly. So it's hard to narrow down exactly what certain animals were related to. Fortunately, with Leptictidium, we have complete fossils, so we should be able to at least code the entire body when we're trying to do these kind of phylogenetic analyses. Unfortunately, because of all the diversity though, it's still really hard to tell. There's a few papers that have suggested different things. One paper suggested that Leptictus and Leptictidium by extension were related to Afrotherians, meaning things like elephants and Tenrax, as well as interestingly, the Sengi. Those animals all have good, strong nose attachments, and so I wouldn't be entirely shocked if this was the case. It also means that Afrotheriates, essentially animals that evolved out of Africa, may not have started in Africa, which is kind of interesting to see. Another paper has them being one of a series of animals which eventually led to the modern placental mammals. Placental mammals are just the ones that have a placenta, so in the modern day at least, it's all mammals except for marsupials and monotremes, the egg-laying mammals. So it's a really good indicator of when true modern mammals started, at least in many places. And I'm saying it's not necessarily right there next to, like directly related to the placentals, but essentially it was, you know, we're progressively getting closer and there's there's many little stair steps until they eventually became true placentals with all those adaptations that go alongside of it. And there was actually another paper that found them as being very close to the first placental mammals. And this paper was trying to look at Cretaceous fossils from Mongolia from just before the extinction. And one of these has some very similar teeth as far as having deep V-shaped cusps. So there's solid arguments for all of these to potentially be right because Leptictidium is just weird and we don't necessarily know exactly where it fits right now, despite having really, really good fossils of it. That said, the papers that have suggested, hey, it's really, really close to placentals, have been the papers that have come out more recently, meaning they've used larger data sets. So for right now, at least, that's probably the safer place to hedge your bets at, which is unfortunate because I really like the idea that it actually was just a big bipedal elephant true, but that's not what the evidence says right now. Instead, it just seems like Leptictidium was close to the root of the modern mammal diversity that we would get today. And the thing is, that's really unfortunate, because that means there's no modern descendants of it that we can study to try and understand what exactly it was. And they died out for one specific reason. I already mentioned the PETM, which caused these large forests to form across the Northern Hemisphere. But that period of warming eventually did end during the following Oligocene and the Miocene. And those forests disappeared. Now, some of the mammals that we do have from the Messel Pit did survive. Primates moved towards the equator, they tracked those forests. Things like the horses actually adapted to the grasslands that would replace the forest. They became larger and more able to process that grass. But Leptictidium, it didn't have all the adaptations to be able to actually succeed in that environment, or to migrate and follow the forests. So they just died out because they weren't adapted to the world and what it became. They were adapted to what the world was, which is unfortunate for them because, again, really, really bizarre mammal that I wish we knew more about. 